and now they're pouring through. Bruce Gibson is falling back in that direction. Now keep in mind, Eric made this point. The Federals had fought here before. They'd fought here before on this ground in August of 1862, specifically. Cedar Mountain Campaign. They knew about this ridge. And this ridge covers, protects that ford, does it not? If you cross, you want a way to get back across. So they immediately head to this ridge. They head in that direction to be sure, but they head to this ridge. And they put cavalry troopers up on this ridge right away. So now you've got pulling across the river, a column of fours, and then they're spreading out, 8th New York, 8th Illinois, 3rd Indiana, 3rd West Virginia Cavalry, companies A and C, they're pouring across. 6th Virginia Cavalry is falling back. Fighting is heavy. The 6th Virginia Cavalry would immediately lose 30 men. Immediately lose 30 men. Right back here and up into the road. So, But the Federals are pushing back. Relentlessly, they're pushing back. Now, on the other side of that ridge, the U Ridge, that ridge is at right angles to Fleetwood Hill. Right angles to Fleetwood Hill. It falls, you see where it falls down? See where it falls down? It falls down into Ruffin's Run. This right here. So the U Ridge, Rooney Lee's brigade, is at Farley, the Welford House, on the other side of the U Ridge. Why is he there? Because the next morning, June 9th, he's to pick his brigade up there cross at Welford's Ford and be on the right flank of Yule uh, Yule's, as Yule heads to the valley. That's why he's there. But Rooney Lee does something that every aggressive officer using good judgment would do. He hears gunfire in this direction. He doesn't wait for orders. Rooney Lee does not. He brings his brigade over that hill and he takes possession of that ridge. So now all of a sudden, early in the morning, early in the morning, you have Federals here, and 800 yards away, you have Federals on that ridge in the uh, Confederates on that ridge in the distance. And what's in the middle? What's in the middle but a stone wall? A little stone wall right down in the bottom, 600 yards from here, pointing right ahead. Now, folks, I'd like for you to do this. Look at all of this. Look at everything. Imagine it without a single tree. That's what you have in June of 1863. Not a single tree is here. This is agricultural intensive. There are no trees. There's some sage, shade trees around the house. That's about it. This, is, this had formerly been tobacco, cotton, non-wheat. Non-wheat in June of 1863. So right there at Stonewall is the demarcation line between this farm, Cunningham Farm, and the Green Farm on the other side, the Dr. Daniel Green Farm. You'll see that on your map. Green Farm, Cunningham Farm. So the Federals see that stone wall now there's some united states cavalry historians here don is here Cooley. uh there's others here that represent u.s cavalry u.s cavalry history and research there's a second u.s cavalry researcher a historian here where's he at back here in the back right here the reserve brigade the pre-war indian fighters this would be easily and I think you'd agree, Don, one of the toughest fights that they ever had right here. They would lose a quarter of their horses and more, a quarter of their men and more. Why? Running across this open ground towards that stone wall, 2nd United States Cavalry, 5th United States Cavalry, 6th United States Cavalry. The 1st U.S. won't come up until later in the afternoon. But right now they're trying, to, they're trying to get custody of that stone wall. They get it. They get it first. But Rooney Lee wants it, and he's got artillery on that hill over there. Two guns from Philip Preston Johnson's section of Brethren's Battery. Uh, Federal Horse Artillery comes up, Elder's Battery. They start vying back and forth across this open ground. One, one Federal Cavalry Trooper said it sounded like Chancellorsville with all this artillery firing back and forth and charges being made across this open ground. So the Federals got the ground first, but they were kicked out of there by Rooney Lee's men. 2nd North Carolina Cavalry, 13th Virginia Cavalry, 10th Virginia Cavalry, the 9th Virginia Cavalry. That's Rooney Lee's brigade. So they dismounted behind that stone wall. And as the Federals charge across this open ground, let me read something to you. Now this officer right here, I like him a lot. You've got a picture of him. 
in your in your packet. His name is Henry Whelan. Henry Whelan is is uh, not a professional soldier, but he's a good officer. He's a good officer, and he will lose his commander at St. James Church. He will lose Robert Morris at St. James Church, so he's in command. And Whelan comes down somewhere in here. The Princess Pennsylvania Cavalry, the survivors, the survivors, somewhere down in here. And he's ordered to take that stone wall, to relieve the skirmishers there. Well, what he says is this. We went through, across that field, a tempest of shell, grape, canister, solid shot, and rifle bullets. I took them, the regiment, the survivors, at a full run. But before we reached the wall, poor Captain Davis was shot dead. Captain Davis, Mike's showing you, he was shot dead with a grape shot. Other men, two other men at my side were literally smashed by a solid shot. A large number of men went down wounded, horses killed. Now this is a man who has just survived a charge at St. James Church in the teeth of Confederate camp, of Confederate canyon, and he's cannon. And he says here, going to and down that wall was decidedly the hottest fire I was ever in. That's a statement. A man could not show his head or finger without a hundred rifle shots whistling about you. I was obliged to ride three times up and down that fearful place with the air almost solid with lead. U.S. United States regulars, 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry, operated with the Reserve Brigade. They went down in droves here. So you can understand when a guy comes out and he says he's going to put a Formula One racetrack right down along that area right there. You can see how your hair might stand up on the back of your neck. Eric, did you want to have anything else to say about that? About the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry? Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry is, of course, Prior to, in, in November of 1861, the, command, the original commanding officer of the regiment, Colonel Richard Henry Rush, who was a member of that legendary West Point class of 1846, was asked by his, uh, his classmate, George McClellan, whether he wanted to arm this regiment with lances. And that was not a, a would you like to, it was a you will. And uh, Colonel Rush said, of course. So for the first year and a half of the war, this unit carried nine foot long lances. If you can imagine this, nine feet long with an 11 inch three bladed tip with an, an iron ferrule at the other end to counter as a counterweight. They made exactly one lance charge that I was able to document in 15 years of research, and that was Company C made a charge at the Battle of Hanover Courthouse in May of 1863. 62, excuse me. The last two companies of the regiment, companies E and I, which were headquarters escort companies to the uh, Army of the Potomac's headquarters turned in their lances on the last day of the Battle of Chancellorsville, May 5th. So the lances were gone by the time they made their charge here. But if you can only imagine, if you will, had they had those weapons making their charges here. <laughs> making a lance <laughs> charge point. at the artillery at St. James Church, or making a lance charge down here at the stone wall. Uh, Major Whelan, I don't know if you're going to read the part, but Major Whelan's horse was shot and killed from under him here. And of course, in honor of the regiment, the horse was named Lancer. And Little Lancer, as he called him, was shot and killed during one of these attacks against the stone wall out here. And before we wrap up the attack at the stone wall and what happens next at 10.30 in the morning, I'd like for Eric to uh, give you a brief overview of the commander, the right-wing commander whose headquarters Noel this is. Those of you who know me know I've been working on John Buford for a long time, so he, he kind of feels like he's family to me. John Buford was born in Versailles, Kentucky on March 4th, 1826, the son of John Buford, a, uh, a merchant and politician, and Ann Bannister Watson Howe Buford, who was the daughter of a uh, naval officer from the Revolutionary War. John Buford was a guy who was destined to be a soldier. His grandfather, Simeon Buford, rode with, with Light Horse Harry Lee's cavalry in, in the Revolutionary War. Under, and of course, Light Horse Harry Lee was Robert E. Lee's father. His great uncle, Colonel Abraham Buford, commanded a regiment of Virginia infantry during the Revolutionary War, got chopped to pieces by Bannister Tarleton at uh, the Battle of Waxhaws in 1781. He had another great uncle by the name of Thomas Buford, who was 
uh, a sergeant during the Braddock expedition, and then later commanding a company, was killed at the Battle of Point Pleasant during Lord Dunmore's War in 1759. So this is a family with a great martial history. John's older half-brother, with the great majestic name of Napoleon Bonaparte Buford, was a member of the West Point class of 1827. Uh, at one point was actually considered to become commander of the Union armies. That would have been a bad choice. Um, but John Buford followed in his older half-brother's footsteps. Uh, it, he had trouble getting into West Point because at the time the War Department had a policy that said that no two sons of the same family could attend. But because John and Napoleon were half-brothers, they were able to find a way around that. The family ultimately relocated to Illinois. Buford attended Knox College for a while and then graduated 16th in the West Point class of 1848. He is a career regular cavalryman, having served his entire career in the 2nd Dragoons. Beginning of the war, he was serving as an inspector general when ultimately John Cope, and perhaps the finest decision he made as an army commander, uh, plucked John Buford out of the inspector general's office, commissioned him a brigadier general, gave him command of a brigade of cavalry, which did superb work during the second Bull Run campaign. And of course, uh, when the Cavalry Corps is formed in the spring of 63, he's given command of the Reserve Brigade. When Stoneman leaves and Pleasanton succeeds to command of the Cavalry Corps, Buford being the senior brigadier, becomes the commander of the 1st Cavalry Division. So, A distinguished officer, and uh, I always like a couple brief little snapshots of him left by some of his men. Wesley Merritt termed him the peerless one. And another man said he was not to be trifled with. My, my favorite quote was John Gibbon, who was his dear friend, said of John of Buford in the years after the war, he said, John G Buford was the, the best cavalryman I ever saw. And this is a guy who served in the Indian Wars in the, in the years after the war and saw a lot of good cavalry officers. So to me, that says a lot. Dies in December of 1863. And great mourning throughout the Army of the Potomac. He dies of disease and uh, sickness, uh, rather, and uh, he's gone now. And that, that, uh, that's a tragedy for the Army of the Potomac. Mm -hmm. The Stonewall, the Confederates hold it, and frankly, they hold it because of, and Craig Swain would be mad at me, he's an artillerist, <laughs> if I didn't say they hold it because of the presence of those two guns over on that ridge. Those two guns served by a, a, a fellow from Lexington, Kentucky, uh, who becomes, after the war, the president of the United States Trotting Association, <laughs> Philip Preston Johnston. He commands those two guns, those two-gun section of Breathed's Battery. The rest of Breathed's Battery is at, at Freeman's Ford just upriver. They will join Johnston later in the, the, in the day. But he fights a heck of a fight. The 2nd North Carolina, the 10th Virginia, 13th Virginia, and the 9th Virginia Cavalry. Rooney Lee holds. That's important. And John Buford's throwing everything he's got at it. But he holds. He holds. Even though he's got superior artillery over here, he holds. And so at 10.30 in the morning, Greg finally has arrived. Greg has arrived at the village of Brandy Station. And as soon as Rooney up there hears that gunfire, that cannon fire behind him, what does that tell him? I got rebels in my rear. I got to get out of here. I got them in my front. I've got them in my rear. So he takes back for that ridge in the in the distance. Now between that ridge and this position is the Green Farm, Dr. Daniel Green's farm. You go, when you leave that position, which looks like great position, you go from great position to terrific position to outstanding position to Mount Olympus <laughs> on the end of the northern crest of, of, and Rooney, he knew good ground and he selected good ground to put his guns on put his dismounts on, and Buford swings around, and he leads the regiment, the 5th U.S., over here on his right to protect from, uh, from attacks from that direction and to secure the fort. So he, uh, Rudy Lee picks up and he heads in that direction. The stone wall is cleared, Buford picks up and he chases Rooney Lee, chases him. Now we're getting ready to go and we're going to walk down to the Cunningham house uh, in this direction. Uh, and um, we're going to be uh, uh, visiting the, uh, the northern extension of this ridge, and I'm going to take you onto a piece of this battlefield where I've never taken another tour group before. Uh, so 
Somebody asked me to tell a story. Yeah. I did. You'll like this. Uh, during the filming of the movie Gettysburg, uh, the actor Sam Elliott was playing John Buford, Eric's hero, and he, Sam Buf Sam Elliott, uh, was he was nailing Buford in this in this performance in the film Gettysburg, and I got a call from his agent or publicist, and John uh, Sam Elliott wanted to come to Brandy Station, and he wanted to see John Buford's great cavalry battlefield, and that's the way Sam Elliott referred to Brandy Station as John Buford's great battlefield. A good description. So. I met him in uh, uh, up in Loudoun County, Sam and I, and I drove him down here. And I took him out to different points of the battlefield. And we got over here on the other side of the battlefield, and he's, he, he's from West Texas. And he had on a white shirt buttoned at the top, uh, uh, jeans. He's a little thinner than me, by the way. And he had western boots. He looked every inch like John Buford. I mean, he looked like John Buford. So he, he kept saying to me in that West Texas accent, he said, Bud, did John Buford, was he here? And I said, well, not exactly right here, Sam. He says, well, take me to where he was. It wasn't a request. <laughs> so I brought him around here, and uh, we walked up here. And uh, I said, Sam, he was right up here. He was directing the Reserve Brigade's attack against the stone wall, and I told him a little bit about this. And then he turns to me and he says, Bud, where did he stand? <laughs> and I said, well, Sam, he, st he stood here. He stood here, right around here. He says, where did he stand exactly? So I, and now I got it. And I walked over like this and I stood quietly and I said, Sam, he stood right here. <laughs> and so Sam walked over like a linebacker after the quarterback. And he knocked me literally off my footprint <laughs> and knocked me back. And he stood there for several minutes. And I stood back here respectfully, got out of his way. And he was in character. And he was looking. You could see like he was making decisions about what John Buford was thinking when he when he, uh, when he uh, was sending these men to uh, attack that stone wall. Three or four minutes went past. And finally he recognized that I was here and he turned. He didn't turn around. He turned and he looked at me and he says, Bud, hot damn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and to this day I still hear from him every now and then. That phone, that the name, that uh, voice from Malibu now, mind you, will call what? <laughs> I sings at Brandy Station. So, folks, any questions here before we head out? Now, the next... Yes, sir. How long was the, the stone wall? The fighting here? Well, the, the length of the stone wall, did it provide good an question. opportunity good question. For, the, good question. for an envelopment on either the right or the left? Okay, I haven't explained the, 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 the line that in detail, but down here at the bottom, there was a house. Uh, and at that house. It was the Wiltshire house, the overseer's house. Incidentally, folks, the Civil War Trust, because my wife asked them to do so, asked Jim Lighthizer personally, to, to sustain that house, which you can't see in the trees, the Civil War Trust paid a nice sum of money to sustain that house because it was an eyewitness of the battle and it is sustained today because one Deborah Fitz wanted it done. And though many of you know Deborah, my wife, uh, she was the assistant editor of the Civil War News. She wanted that house saved, and it's saved today because Jim Lighthizer did her a favor. So, the, the, um, and did all of us a favor. The, the federal, that stone wall goes from Ruffin's Run all the way to the Dadgum River. Good question. On the other side of that stone wall, operating with Rooney Lee, was the 7th Virginia Cavalry of Jones's Brigade. So the Confederate line went all the way around. Now, the, the second mass and the third Wisconsin infantry sent a couple of companies up here, as Buford requested. By the way, if you're into this, guess who else was standing right here? Lieutenant George Armstrong Custer. He was standing here, and he requested permission to go with the infantry 
as they attacked that stone wall. They crawled in the open ground down there in, into the wheat, uh, down into the wheat, and got to the stone wall. And they made some Confederate captures, but really, the Confederates by then were pulling back and out of here. So there was no chance. Your, your question, was there an opportunity to envelop? No, there was not. Because the Confederate line went all the way around from Hazel River, all the way around St. James Church. That's a bigger line, folks, than from Culp's Hill to Big Round Top of Gettysburg. Bigger line. It's a longer line. All the way around. So they, they could not envelop. That's a good question. So the, John Buford was, was, was in despair, obviously, uh, but the Confederates finally made it easy for him because they pulled out. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to walk and... Um, Craig, um, 